Great choice of songs. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. And I'm there, so let's pray. Father God, we need you, uh, as we always do. We are a needy people. More than just your involvement here in the service, Lord, there's uh, needs on each of our hearts that we want you to minister to, uh, that you want to, we want you to be mindful of, that uh, we want you to be a part of and involved with. Lord, we haven't taken prayer requests, but you know the needs on our hearts, and we ask that you'd minister to such. Answer them according to your will and way, and let us uh, give you the glory and the honor for that. But now we are pleading that your presence would be here, that your Holy Spirit would be involved, and that he would guide us into all truth. Open thou our eyes. I uh, like the words in the scripture, how that the disciples on the road to Emmaus had their ears opened and their understanding enlightened because of your involvement in them. Lord, and I pray that you'd help us to do the same. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Amen. All right, we've been in Galatians for a little bit. Uh, we're starting chapter 4, but by way of remembrance, I uh, just want to do a very quick review. We have just finished, uh, the, uh, we're just now getting to the second part of a portion of Galatians where Paul is denouncing the theology of the Galatians. Uh, not not that uh, what they had started, but how that they have recently adopted uh, works as a method of salvation or as a method of keeping their salvation. Uh, this was based upon uh, zealots who had come in and started teaching them, and they had bought into it, and the Galatians were uh, sorely affected, according to Paul. Uh, we've just finished in Galatians chapter 3 that uh, we have been made children of God by faith, and thou now we are a part of Christ, and uh, we are one in Christ. And if we're Christ, then we're Abraham's seed, the Bible says, and that makes us heirs according to the promise. So it's on that note we start Galatians chapter 4 and verse 1. The Bible says there, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is uh, a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, when we were children... We were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And I'm going to stop there. But I want you to notice the progression. Even starting back in Galatians chapter 3, we were children, children of God. And then we became sons. And now we're heirs. All right. So we have children, sons, heirs. Heirs. We are born into God's family, we take on the name of God, and we are made heirs of all that God has to offer. Paul is likening this passage to what many of them knew under uh, Roman rule at that time. So you can be a child in a family, we'll, we'll pretend there's a wealthy Roman family, you can be a child in a family, uh, but you, you don't take really the, the family's name until you come of age. All right, so there's a coming of age ceremony. It was done differently in different places, but uh, there is a ceremony where they came of age. Most of us think, you know, 12 or 13 years of age. Uh, it could be later, depending upon how the family felt that the uh, capability of the, the child was. So as this coming of age, you then took on the name of the father. You know, this would be uh, Josiah, son of Brian Cassida, okay? And, and at that little party that you'd throw, he would be uh, come a Cassida. So before that, he was just a child. He was a child in our family. He had, as the Bible says, governors and tutors and all that. But then there was a time where he would become an heir. So he was a child, and then he becomes a son, son of somebody at a special ceremony. And then after that, there's a point where uh, the father starts thinking, okay, I, I need to prepare my inheritance. I've got to establish my estate. I'm going to make him an heir with all the rights and honors pertaining thereto. And so uh, I would make him an heir, and he would be uh, able to legally uh, obtain all the lands and monies and such of the family. And so Paul is using this understanding of Roman law to teach them an example of what it means uh, about the law versus what we're going to talk about grace. So in this passage, uh, I want you to consider these things. Childhood refers to my condition in God's family. I'm a part of the family. But adoption speaks to my position 
in the family. Does that make sense? You understand that? Childhood refers to my condition in God's family, but adoption speaks to my position in the family. I'm now an heir, all right? Through regeneration, we become a part of God's family, and through adoption, we enjoy God's family. All right, now those happen nearly simultaneously for us. We get regenerated, we're indwelt by the Spirit. The Spirit, then, as we'll read on later, allows us to cry, Abba, Father. All right, and we're made joint heirs. So uh, I want you to notice a few things. Uh, a child is under a schoolmaster and guardians. However, an adopted adult enjoys all the liberties of the family. Uh, the Bible says there in verse 4, I want you to look at that real quick. He says, uh, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Notice a few things. Uh, he says there, made of a woman. All right, so Paul is identifying the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Notice he didn't say made of a man and a woman, uh, not made to a family. He says made of a woman. All right, so this is the virgin birth made under the law. So he was born a Jew. So it's talking about Christ. But when the fullness of time was come, what's the fullness of time mean? Well, first and foremost, it's the fulfillment of the prophecy given by Daniel 483 years ago. All right, it's now time for that prophecy to be fulfilled. It has to be this time. Not only that, you have the state of what's called Pax Romana, uh, which is the, the peace of Rome. So Rome now rules most of the known world at that time, most of the civilized known world. And, and there's highways you can travel all the way up to Britannia, all the way down south to Egypt, and, and have a road the whole time. Uh, which was new. There were shipping lanes uh, uh, around Spain and uh, around Africa. The, this is a, a pretty ingenious time. The, the, uh, the earth is becoming more connected. Not like internet. They didn't have smartphones. Uh, but uh, this was the fastest that anybody had ever been able to travel from one point to another. Uh, then there was the commonness of the Greek language. Uh, the Greek language was considered a, a basis uh, for the Roman Empire, and that's what they used throughout the Roman Empire to talk, kind of like uh, you would identify English. Uh, so like if you, if you fly, uh, you can fly anywhere in the world, talk on a radio, and the tower's going to speak English. They don't change uh, because you have to have one language so that all the pilots and the air traffic controllers understand each other. So English is the uh, language of the air, if you will. Uh, during this time, Greek was the underlying language of the Roman Empire. So you could travel anywhere in the world uh, that was under the Roman Empire, and as long as you knew a little bit of Greek, you could get by, uh, which is the importance of the King James. It was written in the common man's language, Koine Greek, so that everyone could understand. So when the fullness of time was come, we have the Pax Britannia, we have the commonness of the Greek language, and we have the fulfillment of D uh, Daniel's prophecy. Time for Jesus to be born. Uh, in there is Paul's birth and, and the development of the disciples and the establishment of the political conditions in, in Jerusalem where uh, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ would have been just made perfect sense. Uh, before that, it might not have made sense. And after that, it certainly uh, probably would have had some detrimental effects uh, for the political system. But uh, I digress. Uh, I'm a fan of history and I enjoy that. So, uh, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. So again, Paul's battling the theology of the zealots that had come in and said, well, it, it, to be saved, you have to, you have to follow the law. Uh, to be saved, you need to be uh, circumcised. To be saved, you have to do these certain things. Or to stay saved, you have to do these things. And he's trying to refute this, and he's given them some legal examples, and he's talking about Christ and the law. And he uh, goes to verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So he's saying, listen, Jesus Christ came. The fullness of time, everything's perfect. Jesus Christ came, and we were given the opportunity to believe, and in believing were redeemed to become sons. And not just sons, adopted. That means we are joint heirs with Christ. And so we have this privilege now that we are joint heirs with Christ. Uh, verse 6, and because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So the Holy Spirit uh, is evidence of our being joint heirs. You say, I'm not sure I'm going to, uh, 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 you know, what's this heirship? And am I going to have a mansion in heaven? Am I going to get all this? I don't know. One way to answer that is, do you have the Holy Spirit inside of you? 
If you've been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is inside of you, that is your evidence, your evidence that you have a home in heaven and that you are joint heirs with Christ. All right, that's evidence. Uh, then he gets down there into verse 7. I want to look at that real quick. It says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So he, he, he positions two individuals here. He positions a servant and a son, and he's going to contrast those. He says, listen, uh, you are no more a servant, but you're a son. He's, he's talking to the churches of Galatia. Remember, there's a lot of confusion going on. They had been saved under Paul's influence as he traveled around on his first missionary journey. This is the southern churches of Galatia. Traveled around, preached, established churches in each city, came back by, visited them, ended back up, and then goes back through to visit them later. All right, so these are born-again children of God who have been sorely affected by the zealots who came in preaching this confusion of work salvation and uh, maintaining your salvation by works. So he says here, listen, you are no more a servant, but a son. And if you're a son, then you're an heir of God through Christ. Uh, why is it important that you're a servant and not a son? Well, one thing, a servant, going back to this wealthy Roman family, a servant retains the nature of their family. Okay, A servant doesn't become a part of the family that they're serving. They retain the nature of the family that they're from. All right, so you can't be a servant. You don't want to be a servant. I want to be able to go to heaven. I want to be a child of God. I want to be a joint heir with Christ. If I'm a servant, I can't do that because the servant retains the nature of his family. Sons enjoy the nature of their father. Servants have a master. Sons have a father. Servants obey out of law and fear. Sons obey out of love and liberty. Servants are promised no inheritance. Sons can expect to inherit all things. You see the reason why it's so important to understand and for the Galatian church to understand that you're no longer a servant, you're a son. And again, the theme of the passage is li liberty, liberty in Christ. Not the liberty that we hear of today where we, you know, well, you know, it's grace and, and God's, you know, we have liberty in Christ and I can live as I want. No, that's, that's not what we're talking about. Because then you're not describing a son. Remember, a son serves out of love and the freedom to liberty liberty given by grace is afforded to us to do as we ought to do not because we have to and a lot of christians get that confused we we think that well you know you, you go to church uh and, and because you have to no if you came to church today because you have to shame on you you should come to church because you want to well, I got to read my Bible. Wait, 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 wait. What's this God of stuff? What do you mean you got to read your Bible? Don't you want to know God? Shouldn't you? A, a, a son loves. A son does things because they love the Father. Well, I, I want to know more about the Father. Great. Read your Bible. Yeah, you're right. That's awesome. I want to read my Bible. Well, I, I hold on. I, I've got to take some time out because I have to pray. You know, we're, we're checking off our checklist on what it means to be a good Christian. Well, I have to pray. Okay, so you're going to pray. Well, what kind of conversation is that? Okay, Dad, I have to talk to you. How was your day? Fine. Yours? Okay. What did you do today? Nothing. Okay. What, what kind of relationship is that? That's the relationship of a servant. You're not a servant. You're a son. And that's what Paul's trying to get them to understand. But you know what? Our, our modern American churches are struggling with these very issues. And I dare say there are some folks in the, in the church right now uh, that probably have struggled, if not are struggling, with the fact of, you mean I, I can obey out of love? Yeah, in fact, we want you to obey out of love. Uh, like I said before, I don't want you to come to church because you have to. I want you to come to church because you want to. Why would you go to church today? Because I love the Lord. You know, you're at work tomorrow, and they're saying, what'd you do on the holiday weekend? Well, I, I did this, and I did this. Oh, yeah, and I got to go to church. You went to church? Yeah, I love it. I love God. I want to be with God's people. See, there's a different tone that you set when you start talking of things in that manner. It, it's more positive. People might wonder, hey, so what have they got going on at their church, and what makes this guy so excited about his faith, and uh, isn't that a better ambassador? Aren't you a better representative when we do that? That's how I'd like to be. I don't always do it right. 
I slip like everybody else. Yeah, I had to go to church on Sunday. And uh, no, 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 wait, hold on, time out. Shut mouth, do over. I got to go to church on Sunday. I got to spend time with God's people. We got to sing the songs of heaven. I got to hear preaching. It was a privilege. And what a wonderful privilege it was. So we are sons and not servants. Then Paul's making a transition here as he's talking. And in verse 8, he starts with a question. And the question is basically this. Why do you desire to put back on the chains of bondage? Look then in verse 8. He says, how be it then, when ye knew not God, he's talking about before you got saved, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. He, he says, remember when you guys were worshiping idols and, and you guys did those, before you got saved, do you remember all that stuff? How that you had to do things this way and you had to do it that way, otherwise your God might not be happy with you? How many have heard Christians living like that? Again, we're sons. We, we serve out of love and liberty. He says, how be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did serve us unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, he says, but now, he says, after you've already been saved, he says, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to weak and beggarly elements? Did that service that you did to God save you? Yes or no? No. Did that service that you did, did for those little gods, did, did that change you? No. He says, so why then are you going back to those weak and beggarly elements, those elements that say, I need some help. This isn't enough. There's got to be something more. Haven't we all had that conversation in our faith? Isn't that why some of us got saved? Or if you got saved in an early age and you come to that position in life and realize things aren't going the way they're supposed to, and God gets a hold of your heart and you say, God, i got to make a change. i got to do something different. God, forgive me. And, and you experience what they call revival? Why then do we want to go back to those weak and beggarly elements whereby we go, this isn't enough. It, it's not here. You're right. It's in total dependence on God. It's not anything that we do. It's what he does. So he says down there in verse 10, uh, verse 9, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather known of God, how turn ye again to weaker beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? He says, how do I know? Because you observe days and months and times and years. Now, that doesn't mean they all have Franklin planners and uh, they're, they're doing, the, that, that's not what that means. Um, no, Franklin planners are not of the law, nor are they wicked. They're actually somewhat helpful. Uh, but what they're talking about is Jewish holy days and banquets and feasts of all these things that were established because, again, the zealots had moved in. They're preaching this, uh, this uh, theology of Jewry, uh, not jewelry, Jewry. Uh, you get it. Anyways, we're going to move on. Uh, so... Uh, he says, and, and they're preaching all these things and they're confusing you and, and you're going back and trying to do the law and observe the law and follow the law and do all this kind of stuff. And he says, and that's not what saved you. God did. So we go down there to verse 11. Uh, he says, uh, what is that blessed spirit we once enjoyed? So he's, he's asking them specific questions. He's wanting to jog their mind and make them think. First question is, why do you desire to put back on the chains of bondage? Remember where you came from. You served idols. He says, following the law is like serving idols. Okay? He says, but you've been saved. So why go back to that lifestyle? He says, now, where's that blessed spirit we once enjoyed? Look down there in verse 11. He says, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Now, Paul's not saying, I'm fearful of you because you might hurt me. He's, I'm afraid for you. I'm afraid of what you might become. I'm afraid of your condition. I'm afraid of the direction that you're headed in. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. He says, brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. He's saying, listen, I want you to be free. He says, I'm living in liberty. Guess what? You have that now. 
He says in verse uh, uh, 13, Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first, and my temptation which was in my flesh ye despise not. Uh, let's see, I lost my place. You despise not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? He says, you remember, he said, listen, I'm, I'm really afraid for where you guys are headed. He says, I, I'm, I'm worried that all the labor that I've bestowed upon you is in vain. He says, I'm begging you. I want you to be free like I'm free, like you're free. Uh, you've not hurt me. Verse 13, he says, and, and you know the infirmity of the flesh, and we've talked about this before. Paul had an infirmity of the flesh, something in his eyesight. He b besought the Lord three times to remove it, and uh, that thorn in the flesh, and God said, my grace is sufficient for you. So he endured, but it affected him. Uh, we've read even that one of his letters he wrote with his own hand and how it was large letter, indicating that he had poor eyesight. And so he, he goes there, he says, you know, in the, firm, in the infirmity of the flesh, I preach the gospel unto you, and my temptation or my struggle, which was in my flesh, ye despise not. He said, you didn't look down on me for my condition, for my, for my eyes. And he says, uh, you, but you receive me. You receive me as an angel of God, a messenger. Even as, he says, you, I don't, the way I felt treated, I don't think you could have treated Christ any better. All right, verse 15. Where is then the blessedness you spake of? Word blessedness can also be a deep-seated happiness or sweetness of, of fellowship. He says, where, in, where is that happy spirit? Where is that sweetness of fellowship? Where is that relationship? He says, for I bear you record. He says, I, I, I can testify because you guys said this, that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Now, that's a pretty pretty decent relationship there. I mean, how many people do you know that will pluck out an eye for you? And Paul says, I bear your record that you were zealous about our, you would have plucked out your very eyes and given them to me if you could. Wow, Paul. So he's questioning them. He's saying, listen, how, how are you in this position? Where's that blessed spirit that we enjoyed, that happiness? He says, why do you desire to put back on the chains of bondage? And in verse uh, 16, how did I become your enemy? How did I become your enemy? Uh, verse 16 there, and uh, we'll read on. He says, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Question mark. Am I become your enemy? He says that, that sweet relationship, I led you to the Lord. I saw you got saved. I taught you. I bestowed labor on you. We, we had this great relationship. You, you accepted me as I was, even though I had infirmities, even though I was uh, handicapped. He says, you still accepted me. In fact, you would have plucked out your own eyes for me. How is it then I'm become your enemy? Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? It says they, those zealots coming in, zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. Uh, but it is a good thing to, but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I am present with you. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Uh, here's probably the most endearing verse that the Galatians will receive from Paul in the entire book. Uh, verse 19, my little children, he says, okay, he, he's referencing the fact that he led them to Christ. He's referencing the fact that he won them over, taught them, and uh, they are now uh, in the faith because of his leadership in their life. He says, my little children, of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you. He says, listen, I would labor and birth again and again, and again, and again, and again, until Christ, until Christ is formed in you. He had a heart for these, but he was very concerned. Am I your enemy? He says, don't you know that I, I, I would labor and birth for you over and over and over and over again, and I would do it until Christ is finally formed in you. That would be a great uh, verse to memorize if you wanted to disciple somebody and to have a, a, a kind of a mantra or a motto or a passion for discipleship. 
You know, we as uh, we as Christians, can I even say we, we as Baptists, we, we preach a lot, go out and, and preach the gospel. Go tell others how to get saved. But we don't talk very much about verse 19. Of whom I travail in birth again and again and again until Christ be formed in you. When we win somebody to Christ, we should have the same passion that Paul had for the church of Galatia, churches of Galatia. We should have that same desire to see Christ formed in them. And the same effort that we went to winning them to Christ, to seeing them saved, is the same effort that we should be putting in to the development of their faith. I am as guilty as the next guy. Had over 6,000 people saved in personal one-on-one -on -one soul winning. I probably count on all my hands and toes, fingers and toes, the number of people that I've actually discipled, spent time with. I, I wonder what our nation would be like today if all of our fundamental Baptist churches had focused on discipleship along with that soul winning. Instead of just desiring somebody to be saved, we would desire that Christ would be born in them, formed in them, developed in them. How many people have I met? Yeah, I did that once a long time ago. And you're like, huh? Uh, you're sitting on the steps of a crack house. How is that possible? That's because somebody did win them to the Lord. And praise the Lord that they did. I'm not diminishing that act at all. But nobody fought for them so that Christ could be formed in them. It's 2 Peter chapter 1. Turn there real quick. If my pages won't stick together, there we go. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Talking about salvation, verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, add to your faith, which is what you just got saved with, virtue. And add to that knowledge, to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is what? He's blind and cannot see afar off and hath what? forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. I wonder how many people we're going to see in heaven that are going to ask us, why didn't you teach me? You showed me the gospel. I got saved, but you didn't help me. There was no virtue added to my faith. There was no knowledge added to my virtue and no temperance uh, to that knowledge and no patience to that temperance and no godliness to that patience and so on and so forth. There was nothing added. Nobody taught me. And because of it, the Bible says that that person becomes blind. They cannot see afar off. And at some point in time can even get to the point where they forget that they were purged, saved from their sins. Doesn't mean that they weren't saved. They just forgot that they were. What a terrible state to live in. To be saved and to live in fear of where I might go because 
I didn't grow. I forgot. Paul's like, I'm not going to let that happen to you. He says, I'm fighting for you. In fact, that's why I'm writing this letter to you. I'm going to work. I'm going to, if it takes laboring in birth again and again and again and again, is the tense in the Greek, until Christ is formed in you. That's what I'm going to do. So we read down there, verse 9, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. He says in verse 20, I desire to present uh, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. So he's got some doubts. He says, listen, I really want to be there with you right now. He says, I, I want to see with my own eyes the condition uh, of your spirit and your standing and, and where you're at. And he says, because right now everything that I'm hearing, which is why he's writing this letter, I have some concerns. I'm worried about you. And then he, verses 21 through 31 are basically one subject. He says, I want to ask you a question. He says, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? So verses 21 through 31, I'm going to read them, and then I'm going to put them all together and summarize them. He says, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, bondmaid, and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. So he's telling, listen, this is what I'm going to do. He says, you remember the story of Abraham. He had Hagar. He had Sarah. All right. Hagar was a bondmaid. She was a slave. Hagar was a, uh, uh, Sarah was a free woman. Ishmael, who was born to Hagar, was born after the flesh. Isaac, who was born to Sarah, was born after the promise. Okay, he says these things are an allegory, meaning they symbolize something. Uh, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry thou that travailest not. Uh, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, are uh, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Okay, so he's explaining. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. He said the same thing is happening now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Very strong words. To make sure that you understand that, I want to take us back to Genesis. All right? That's not a radio program, by the way. Actually, it is. I'm just not going to do it. Uh, Genesis chapter 16, if you would, please. Genesis chapter 16. Verse 1. It says, now Sarah, Sarai's, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had in handmaid an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my handmaid, or unto my maid, that, may be, that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai, and Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years uh, in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went into unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, uh, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, the maid is in thy hand. Do uh, to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. She comes back. Uh, and uh, she births Ishmael, all right? So Ishmael and Hagar are living in Abraham's household. I want you to turn to chapter 21. Sarai, Sarah, is still barren. She hasn't born any children yet. We get to uh, chapter 21 and verse 1. It says, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord said unto Sarah as he had spoken, for uh, Sarah conceived and bare Abram, uh, Abraham a son in his old age, and uh, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son, 
that was born unto him, when whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac, and Abraham sac um, <coughs> excuse me, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. <coughs> and Abraham was an hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all uh, that here will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abram that Sarah uh, would have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, when she had borne unto him Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. So here's the story. Uh, the two ladies, Hagar, uh, Sarah. Sarah says, I'm barren. I can't give you children. Uh, take your slave girl, uh, Hagar, uh, to be a wife and have children by her. She conceives. Hagar's now despising, looking down on Sarah. Well, I can have children and you can't. Uh, so a time goes. Uh, Sarah becomes rather despondent. God promises a son. Sarah has a, a son by promise given by God. His name is Isaac. We have Ishmael. So we have these four people, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, Isaac. Hagar, bondmaid. Sarah, free. Ishmael was born to the slave girl. Isaac to the free woman. All right, so here's what happens. Hagar represents the law, according to the passage there in Galatians chapter 4. Uh, she also represents the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, the headquarters of the law. Uh, and Jerusalem now, as the Galatian book, uh, chapter in Galatians says, uh, Sarah represents grace. She also represents Mount Zion, or the new Jerusalem, as the scripture says, the headquarters of liberty. Ishmael refers to the flesh and how the law makes sense to the flesh. Isaac refers to the spirit and the liberty born of grace. So what does the law do to grace? That's what Paul's asking. What's the law do to grace? Look back there in verse 21. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? He said, what was the law doing to the son of liberty? to the son that was born of grace by promise. What's the law do? Anybody? Four-letter word. It's an okay word to say in church, by the way. He mocked him. Ishmael, born of a slave girl in bondage, mocks the freeborn son. And Paul's trying to tell the churches of Galatia, listen, when you add works to salvation, when you focus on the law, when you preach that it's okay to keep your salvation by works of the law, where you say you have to be circumcised, where you say you have to follow the law to do these things, to enjoy the grace that's given by faith freely. He says when you do those things, guess what? The law is mocking grace. It's making fun of. It's laughing in the face of. It's saying, are you serious? I was here first. And you know what? The law was here first. The law came before Christ came. Christ came to fulfill the law. Not to get rid of it. But the law still mocked in the face of Christ and said, listen, uh, we want to, these people to be in bondage. Listen, God never wanted our faith to be something that we had to do. He wanted what we do in our faith to be something that we want to do. Because we love him. Because we want to follow him. Because we want to please him. Because we want to do that which makes him happy. Not because we have to. It's no wonder that we find Christians who get weary. Christians who... Uh, grow callous in the faith. Christians who forget how to love because, uh, you know what, they weren't doing it in love to begin with. And they're a sad testament for faith. Well, bless God, God got a church today. Well, you know what we're doing today. We're going out and uh, knocking on doors because we have to. No, because we get to. Because it's our privilege, because we love God, because we want other people to have a relationship with this phenomenal God that we serve. 
You remember the sermon from this morning? What an awesome God we have. How could we pass up the opportunity to share him with somebody else? The law doesn't speak that way. The law says, you've got to be a good person. Did you read your Bible today? Oh, you need to feel bad about that. Did you pray? Oh, man. Watching you. Did you, did you, did you? And you know what? You don't find a lot of those did you's here in Scripture. There's one law Christ ever gave. Anybody know what it is? Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's the only law that was ever given with Christ. So what we ought to be doing is, hey, Will, what's your burden? In fact, I ought to probably know him well enough I don't have to ask him. I could probably just tell. And fulfill that burden. And when I do so, I am fulfilling what Christ wants me to do. Now the question is, do I want to be like the churches of Galatia? Or am I going to live as an heir? Am I going to struggle with my faith trying to please God? Instead of jump into my faith and just love God. Because that love should provoke us to action. If you love him, what's the Bible say in John 14? Keep his commandments. Well, I'm, I'm going to do this. Why? Because I love him. And I'm going to do this. Why? Because I love him. I'm going to do this. Why? Because I love him. I want to do these things because I love God. Oh, to meet more Christians like that. Oh, to meet more Christians that speak like that and that share their faith with others like that. Instead of a having to faith or I've got to faith, it's an I get to faith. That's what we need. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody's looking around.